Hello everyone, Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we are going to be talking about multiple linear regression. If you haven't looked at my previous video um, talking about simple linear regression, I would strongly recommend for you to finish that video first before moving on to this video today. All right, so what is multiple linear regression? So when you have more than one independent variable, um, you run multiple linear regression instead of a simple linear regression. Um, but bear in mind that, okay, you can only have one DV. So the objective for MLR is to test if variable Y, your dependent variable, depends on variables X, Y, and Z, multiple variables, right? So here's the equation, but if you find that too confusing, let's take a look at the um, hypothesis over here, right? So basically the hypothesis Y does not depend on any of the X's and Y depends on at least one of the X's or, or at least one of the factors. So remember in your thesis or in your proposal, you mentioned that you want to identify which factors or um, whether several factors influence a dependent variable. So this is what you use. You use multiple regression. Uh, let's take a look at another example over here. So let's take a look at the null hypothesis tangibility. So these are all the IVs, okay? If you notice that these IVs come from service quality, servqual by Paras Raman, okay? Tangibility, responsiveness, and reliability does not affect customer satisfaction. Okay, that's your null hypothesis. And then we have our alternative hypothesis where we say that tangibility, responsiveness, and reliability significantly affect customer satisfaction. So pause for a moment and think about your research. Think about your objective and your hypothesis. What analysis will you run? So this is the multiple linear regression equation. It is basically the same with the simple linear regression equation, except that it has more axes since we have more than one variables. So Y again is the same. Y is going to be your DV and you're going to have X1, X2, X3 until XK where K is the number of independent variables that you have. E is your error term and your beta scores are the regression coefficients. Again, we are going to be talking about the assumptions for linear regression. Basically, some of the assumptions are the same, but some of the assumptions is specific for multiple linear regression. The same assumptions such as outliers, um, linear regression are sensitive towards outliers. Um, your DV needs to be continuous. You know that already. Okay, sample size. For multiple linear regression, your sample size can be calculated using several formulas. Um, example here, I have included the Tabanik and Fidel from um, Tabanik and Fidel's formula in 2013, where n equals to 50 plus m, and where m is the number of independent variables, including your mediator or moderator variables. Okay. So for example, if you have two variables, uh, 50 plus 8 multiplied by 2, so 8 multiplied by 2 is 16, 50 plus 16 is 66, right? So your minimum sample size required for you to run a regression, a multiple regression analysis at that point of time is 66. But definitely you would collect more to allow any attrition that may occur. Or according to Green, this is another formula according to Green, 104 plus K, where K is the number of IVs in the model. So for example, let's take the same example uh, as previously mentioned. If your independent variables, you only have two independent variables, then 104 plus 2. So that's going to be 106. Okay, so that's going to be your minimum sample size. You can also use Cohen's power primer. You can also use G power and any other formulas that you like. All right. In multiple linear regression, we have the assumptions for multicollinearity because we have more than one independent variable as well as singularity. So what are these two? Multicollinearity are when the IVs are highly correlated. The R score is 0.9 and above. What happens when the IVs are highly correlated? It's basically the same variable. Okay, when they are too correlated, we see it as the same variable. So why bother having more than one variable? Okay, singularity is actually is when one IV is actually a combination of other IV. So we have to check that out as well. Same with simple linear regression. We also need to check for normality, linearity, homoscedasticity, as well as independence of residuals. For multicollinearity, you can check the correlations table. Check that if the IVs is associated with DV, R needs to be 
more than 0.3. Check correlations between the IV where the R should not exceed 0.9. So if it doesn't exceed 0.9, you're safe. There's no multicollinearity. You can also check for the collinearity diagnostics. Okay, so this is under the coefficients table. You can check for the VIF, uh, the variance inflation factors, as well as the tolerance. So your VIF needs to be less than 10 and your tolerance should be more than 0.1. Tolerance is how much of the variability of the specified IV is not explained by other IVs in the model. Small values suggest presence of multicollinearity, right? Variance inflation factors is the inverse of the tolerance. So um, a value larger than 10 suggests multicollinearity. So that's why we have the threshold over here, okay? Um, this has been mentioned in the previous video, so I'm just going to skip this. The normality, the linearity, homoscedasticity, as well as independence of residuals. So let's take a look at the example we have here. Basically, it's the same data. I have included another independent variable over here. So previously, we only had income and car price. So now we have each income as well as car price. So what did the bank loan wanted to know? Bank loan, oh, sorry, bank loan officer wanted to know. The bank loan officer wanted to inspect the association between customers' age, income, and the value of the car that his prospective customers purchased. Okay, 20 customers were selected randomly, though a minimum sample size of 106 is needed just for the purpose of a demo, a sample size of 20 is used. Okay, so remember for multiple linear regression or for any other statistical analysis, you need to meet the minimum sample size. So this is why we have a sample size calculation in our thesis, in our proposal. All right. So objective is to test whether, uh, whether age and income influence car price or age and income can be used to predict car price. When we talk about relationship, oftentimes people get confused with correlation, right? So let's change it to influence or you can say that whether there's an effect of age and income on car price or we can say prediction, okay? So let's not forget you have a hypothesis over that. The hypothesis is basically the same. It's just that you add more... Um, independent variables to it. So I already have my data over here. So this is my data. This is the variable view over here. And then you're gonna see the data view. So make sure your data looks like this. Go to graphs, legacy dialogues, scatter. So because I have more than one independent variable, I would want to use the matrix um, scatter plot. All right. Matrix variable is going to be your age and income as well as car price. All right, just click on OK. It's going to give you a graph over here. So this is um, age and car price. If you can see over here, as age goes higher, as you get older, the car price that you purchase tends to be um, more expensive. Okay, that, that's just logic because probably if you are older, you would have more income, right? Due to experience, due to your qualifications and whatnot. Okay, so this is just a, like, a, uh, just for you to be able to get the gist of how the data is distributed. Okay, so you can see here it's, it's linear. It seems normal. It seems that there's no significant outliers, right? But you can't tell for sure. So that's why you need to supplement it with other assumptions, all right? Okay, let's take a look at the income against car price. As your income goes higher, if you have a higher income, if you earn more, then your car price is going to be more expensive. And let's take a look at age and income. So as you get older, uh, the more income you make, all right? So go to analyze. Now we run, uh, we, we want to run our regression since we look at the data. It seems normal, right? Um, we don't know for sure. Okay, go to regression. Go to linear, right? Okay, car price is going to be our dependent variable and age and income is going to be our independent variables. Go to statistics. It's going to be the same with your simple linear regression. Just click here, here plot okay this is for us to be able to see the independence of residuals so Zach predictor is going to be my x um, so y is my standardized residuals I want the normal probability plot okay save 
Uh, if you want mahala nobis distance, if you want to save, you want to save standardized residuals, you can you can do that. Right, options. Uh, nothing in options. Right. So you can see the descriptive over here. Um, the Pearson correlation. Uh, Look at the car price in H, um, it's 0.649, it's okay, there's still correlation. According to Cohen, a uh, correlation of more po more than 0 0.30 is um, acceptable. And then you can look at the car price against income. So car price and income, there's a correlation of 0.932, which is fairly high, right? So you can see we have the model summary over here. Your R squared is 0.872. Um, it says that uh, basically your model explains 87% of the variance in the dependent variable. Okay. You have your DF over here, significant uh, significance of change is 0 0.00. Let's take a look at the R ANOVA table. It is significant. Okay. So it's a good model. It can be used to predict a uh, car price. Uh, let's take a look at the coefficients. You have to look at the significance of each um, independent variable. It seemed that only income is a significant predictor for your dependent variable, but not H because it's not significant over here, right? So let's take a look at the, okay, it seemed normal. It is distributed on the, along the line. Okay, let's take a look at the scatter plot. Okay, it is within um, plus minus three. There's no significant outliers over here. It seemed that the assumptions for homoscedasticity is upheld and independence of residual since it is located within plus minus three. Okay, let's take a look if they have profile. Okay, there you go, collinearity uh, uh, statistics. So we need a VIF of less than 10. So our VIF is okay. And then tolerance of not less than 0.1. So our tolerance and VIF is okay. We don't have an issue of multi-collinearity, right? So let's go back to our slides here. So this has been explained earlier. So this is not for sure. Okay, this is not for sure. You, whatever it is, you, you can't simply say that um, as people get older or as the respondents get older, they purchase a more expensive price. The data seem to show you that, but we do not know for sure whether this is significant or not. So which is why we need to, we need to still take a look at the output of the regression analysis, right? Okay, so let's take a look at the model summary. R squared is uh, 0 0.87. 87% of the variance in, in price can be explained by both age and income. Uh, P-value from the ANOVA table is less than 0 0.05, which means that at least one of the two variables, income and age, can be used to predict um, the car price. Okay, so this is the equation where y equals to constant plus your beta of all of your independent variables. Okay. So this is from here, constant, and this is from your income, and this is from your age over here. For every unit increase in age, price will drop by 0 0.450. Why do I see drop? Because there's a negative value over here, provided that the customer's income level remains unchanged. Similarly, for every unit increase in income, price will go up by 2.887 units, provided that the customer is still of the same age, right? Based on the standardized beta coefficient effect of income is 1.001. So this is if you want to use the standardized beta, right? We typically use the unstandardized beta. So this is from the unstandardized beta. This is if you want to use the standardized beta, okay? Which is about 10 times higher than the effect of H. P-value is 0 0.0481, which is more than 0 0.05. Age is not a significant predictor of car price. P value of income is less than 0 0.05. Therefore, income is a significant predictor of car price. So let's take a look at the reporting in the APA format. As usual, you have to mention the analysis that you used, okay, or the analysis that you ran. A multiple linear regression was calculated to predict pre respondent's car price based on income and age, okay. A significant regression equation was found. F, uh, this is your DF, okay. Uh, P-value is less than 0 0.001 with an R squared of 0.872. Respondents predicted car price is equal to point, uh, to sorry, to negative 7.28. This is in thousands of dollars. Okay, remember that. Plus 2.68 income and minus 
0.45H, where income is measured in thousands of dollars and age is measured in number of years. Respondents' car price increased $2.688,000 for each thousand of dollars increase in income and decreased $0.45,000 for yearly increase in age. Only income is a significant predictor for car price. Okay, since we have to look at the significance level over here. So it doesn't really, so the matrix scatter plot, you can't conclude using a matrix scatter plot. You still have to look at your output, your regression output. All right, so pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So this is exercise one for you to um, do it on your own. So instead of only having social influence, I have added performance expectations. So typically, um, if you can refer to your own research, you can see how many IVs do you have, right? If you have more than one IV, then you can already decide which analysis that you need to use, all right? So use the same data as uploaded in your Google Classroom. And I shall see you um, during class for us to discuss the answers for these exercises. Thank you very much.